Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Jenny. Appreciate you assisting in our worship this evening. Turn, please turn to your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I wanted to mention we had a good teen event on Friday. We went mini golfing and uh, we had 12 teens, which was a good turnout. And we had a great time and ate pizza and did laser tag and go-karts, and it was just a fun time. And uh, kids seemed to enjoy it, and we don't do a lot of teen events, and so it was nice for them to get together as a group and fellowship and have fun, and I'm thankful for how that went. First Chronicles chapter 29, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 20 tonight, verses 1 through 20. It says, Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom, I'm sorry, my eye, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of of my God, the gold for the things to be made of gold, the silver for the things of silver, the brass for the things of brass, the iron for the things of iron, and wood for the things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, glister, glistering stones and the, of diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of my own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Even 3,000 talents of gold of the gold of Ophir and 7,000 uh, talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the house withal. The gold for the things of gold, the silver for the things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of are the, uh, of the artificers, and who then is willing, he says, and who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Then the chief of the fathers and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly and gave for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams, and of silver 10,000 talents, and of brass 18,000 talents, and 100,000 talents of iron. And they with whom precious stones were found gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel, Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced, for that they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord, and David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, and David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might, and in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people that we should be able to? To offer so willingly after this sort. For all things come of thee, and of thine own hand have we given thee. For we are strangers before thee, and sojourners, as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow, and there is none abiding. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand, and is all th thine own. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart have I willingly offered all these things, and now have I seen with joy thy people which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. O Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and of Israel, our fathers, 
Keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people, and prepare their heart unto thee. And give unto Solomon my son a perfect heart, to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do all these things, and to build the palace for which I have made provision." And David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God. And all the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshipped the Lord and the king. Let's read 21 as well. And it says, And they sacrificed sacrifices unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings unto the Lord. On the morrow after that day, even a thousand bullocks, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. I want to preach to you tonight about giving back to God, giving back to God. Let's pray and ask him to bless his word. Father, thank you so much for the truths in this passage. Lord, there are reminders in this section of scripture that we need to hear. There are things here that we forget, that we neglect. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me as I preach this passage. Help us to focus and meditate on these truths and to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I ask you to work tonight through this passage of scripture, Lord. I ask this in your son's name. Amen. We're talking about giving tonight. And I know that some pastors get very nervous when they talk about money, talk about giving. They fear that uh, pastors have this fear that they'll be lab labeled as like a money grubber or somebody that begs for money. And the truth is that unfortunately, especially if you watch church on TV, there are many ministries that are trying to get as much money out of people as they possibly can. And let me just say tonight, that is not our church. We are not constantly talking about money. We are not constantly emphasizing money. We here trust God to provide our needs, and I'm thankful for that. However, it is good and right for a pastor to preach about giving because giving is important. Giving is in scripture and it's all throughout the Bible. And so pastors shouldn't be ashamed when they preach about giving. And I'm not afraid to preach about giving because I know my heart in this area that I, I'm trusting God in this. And I'm not trying to uh, pull it. We're not going to pass a plate after this message tonight, okay? This is, uh, this is allowing God to do a work in your heart. But tonight's passage is not talking about regular tithing, if you're paying attention to what's going on here. This is not talking about the regular tithes that the Jews gave or the regular offerings that they gave. This passage is talking about a special one-time event where the people were called by David. He put out a call to, to give, to consecrate their service for the temple. In other words, here's an opportunity for you all to give to the building of the first temple. And this was a very special day in Israel's history. And David is also here, not only uh, preparing for the temple, but he's also, in a sense, passing the baton to Solomon, his son. And in the process, he gives this invitation, and the people respond to his invitation to give, and they give with a great generosity here. And it, it was, I think as I read this, I see this as a wonderful day. In Israel's history. I want us to learn some lessons from this passage. If you're taking notes tonight, I want you to see uh, three lessons about giving to God. Three lessons about giving to God. I think there's some very instructive things for us tonight that would help us as we try to be generous. I hope you, want, I hope you are, and I hope you're striving to be a generous person. God blesses generosity. Um, and that is what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's look at number one. Biblical generosity requires a right attitude. Biblical generosity requires a right attitude. Look at verse 9 again. It says, Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly. It's a little confusing there, but it's actually, if you study it, it's the leaders, the captains and the chiefs, that offered willingly, and the people under them rejoiced because their leadership gave willingly. Here, let's keep reading. Because with a perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord, 
And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. Look down at verse 17. He says, I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now I have seen with joy thy people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto thee. Biblical generosity requires a right attitude. And what is that attitude? It's giving willingly. It's giving willingly. Meaning, you want to do it. That's the attitude. If we're going to give and be generous biblically, we need to cultivate a desire to give. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says this, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth what? A cheerful giver. As Christians, God love. I say this all the time, you're probably tired of hearing it, but God wants our hearts, right? And so in this matter of giving, it's not the dollar amount that matters. It's not the, the, the details of what you're giving. What really matters is your heart behind the generosity. And what God desires is that we want to give to him and we want to give to others. Imagine if you're a parent and you have a, you have a teenage child and, and it's Christmas time and you walk by a room and you see them wrapping a present for you. And you hear them talking to themselves and they say something like, oh, I don't know why I have to buy her a gift every year. This is such a pain. Sounds like something a teenager would say, probably, maybe. If, as a parent, if you heard your child say that, what would that make you feel? You'd say, I don't care what that gift is. I don't want it. Wouldn't you feel that way? Some of you are like, no, I want the guy. I don't care what their attitude is. No, I think most parents would say, I don't really care about what the gift is. It hurt me that you have that attitude that it's a burden, that it's a pain for you to give to me. The heart is what matters. That's why we say that it's the thought that counts. That's where that comes from. Is because we all know it's the, we know that with gifts to each other. But we forget that when it comes to giving to God. That God requires, biblical generosity is, requires the right attitude. And that is a willing heart. Biblical generosity requires a right attitude, which is a willing attitude, a desire to give. And that what makes this passage so special is that these people, these Jews, these Israelites, they wanted to give to the temple. They were overjoyed. They had a heart that said, I want to give to God. I want to be part of what God is doing in this place. What a blessing that is. Let's look at number two tonight. Number two. Biblical generosity requires right thinking. Biblical generosity requires right thinking. Look with me at verse 13. It says, Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Whoa, that's an interesting statement. Do you know what he's saying there? David is saying this. It is a privilege that we get to give to God. That's what he's saying there. There's three things I have under here, under right thinking about generosity. The first is we need to th realize, we need to think right, that it is a privilege to give to God. That's what he says here. He says, who are we? We don't even deserve to get to be part of this. David understood, and David taught the people, and the people understood that it was a privilege, it was a great blessing that they were given the opportunity to be generous. Let's keep reading there. Where do we leave off? Verse 13, 14. He says, That we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort, for all things come of thee. What is he saying there? David is saying this, it's a blessing and a privilege we get to give because everything we have, this is the second thing under number two, biblical generosity requires right thinking. The second thing is everything we have is from God. This is how we should think, Christian. We should live with this recognition that everything you have is a gift from God. The Bible says, what do you have that you have not received? 
You say, well, I worked hard for that. I slaved. I got up early in the morning. I drank my coffee. I went into work and worked hard. Yes, you did. But who gave you the body that can work? Who gave you the health that can work? Who gave you the job that that gives you this money? Who gave you the mental faculties to do what you do? God gave you all those things. There's nothing we can look at and say, that's me. God doesn't have any part of that. No, everything we have is from God. And this is crucial thinking in our minds, if we are going to be generous people, is to have this in our minds that everything I have comes from God. And then look at how he finishes verse 13, verse 14. It says, he said, for all of these things come of thee and of thine own, of thine own have we given thee. You know what he's saying there? That not only comes from you, but it what? It belongs to you. Everything we have belongs to God. Look, look down there. Let's see at verse 16. He says, O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. It's a privilege to give to God. It is everything we have comes from God and everything we have belongs to God. This is the kind of mindset that David had. And that's why he could give so generously is because he was thinking biblically about his possessions. In other words, being generous is a gift from God because he's allowing us to be part of what he is doing. Really, if we think of it accurately, when we're generous to God, it's like we're spending someone else's money. His. How many of you like spending someone else's money? We've been gifted some gift cards lately to restaurants. And you know what I found? The food tastes better when you don't pay for it. Isn't that weird? My mom always said the food tastes better when she didn't have to cook it. That's probably true. But when someone else pays for it out of their generosity, it changes it. It's it's better. And really, when we are generous, we don't think of it this way. But when we're generous with our own money, guess what? It's not our own money. We're giving back to God what is his. Do you see how this kind of thinking changes the whole equation? It it should change how we think. We're not giving it away. We're what? We're giving it back. We're giving it back to a God who is powerful and, and able to bless us. And so biblical generosity requires the right thinking. Christian, let me just pause here in a second and say we wander from these truths. We start to think that our stuff is our stuff. We get possessive of it. We start to treat stuff like, no, that's mine. Christian, we need to live. We're, we're going to see in the book of Acts very soon. They had problems right off the bat in the church. Let me, spoiler alert, if you're reading Acts. They had their problems, and this actually fits very well with what we're going to read about here in Acts soon. But you know what they did? They looked at their stuff and said, this is God's stuff. I'm going to share it with those who need it. If we're going to be generous as people, we need to think right about these things. It's a privilege to give to God. Everything we have comes from him. Everything we have belongs to him. And when we have that mindset, then we can give joyfully and willingly because we're part of what God's doing. Let's see the third thing tonight, number three. Biblical generosity has a great impact. Biblical generosity has a great impact. This point has three sub points as well. I want us to see three things here under the impact that our generosity can have if we do it biblically. The first thing I want us to see is it brings joy to God's people. Look at verse nine again there. Then the people rejoiced. Why? For that they offered willingly. Look at verse seven, the end of verse 17. He says, I have willingly offered all these things, and now I have seen with joy thy people which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. There is something wonderful about when God's people are generous, when an opportunity arises, when a need arises, and God's people step up and they they willingly give to a cause, to a purpose. There is something that, that brings great joy. It brings great joy for the receiver, but it brings, I believe, more joy. Jesus said what? It is more blessed to give 
than to receive. There is great joy when you can be part and be generous and give. There's great joy in that. Everyone in this passage, the sense, the, the sense of this whole chapter was it's just a joy fest. Just happy, happy, happy. Everybody was happy. You don't sense any division. You don't sense any ingratitude. You don't sense any obligation. You don't sense any frustration or fear. All you sense is we're about to build, build God's temple and we're going to do it together. And let's get together and give. Biblical generosity brings great joy to God's people. I'd like you to see, secondly, under this point, it equips the work. Look at verse 16. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thy holy name cometh of thy hand is, and is all thine own. This was a great collection of resources that David did the bulk of and the people contributed to here and this prepared Solomon to build the most amazing most glorious temple do you remember it's a, it's a really sad and interesting story do you remember when Israel is taken to away and they come back and they build the second temple they build spoiler alert here sorry this temple gets destroyed okay I know some of you aren't there yet this temple, Solomon's temple, because of sin and judgment, this glorious temple gets destroyed. And thankfully, Israel comes back later, and God is gracious to them, brings them back in the land, and they rebuild the temple. And the younger generation, they walk into the temple, and the younger generation is rejoicing. And what is the older generation doing? Crying. Not tears of joy. Tears of sadness. Do you know why? It paled in comparison to Solomon's temple. They were standing there going, this is nothing like what we had before. And it broke their hearts. What, a, what an interesting story there. And yet God still blessed it. God still used it. And yet what I'm saying all that, I'm, I'm bringing that story up to say Solomon's temple was above and beyond. It was glorious. It brought awe to the people. Of how great God was. And that was all made possible by biblical generosity. It was made possible because of King David's generosity. It was made possible because of the people's generosity. All of this was given. I don't read anything about them having to spend a ton of money. Now there was an, some agreements made for some of the lumber with other nations and stuff like that. But God provided through people everything. Biblical generosity has a great impact in that it equips the work. Thankful for that. Let's look at the third subpoint under this one. Biblical generosity has a great impact because it encourages worship. It encourages worship. Look at verses 20 and 21. It says, And David said to all the congregation, Now bless the Lord your God. And all the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshipped the Lord and the king. And they sacrificed sacrifices unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings unto the Lord. On the morrow after the day, even a thousand bullocks and a thousand rams and a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. This act of great generosity and unity and joy, what did it lead to? What was the outcome of all this? It was two days of wonderful worship. We talk about worship all the time here. I feel like I, I do feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but it is why we come here. Worship is not the reason we exist as a church in itself. We have the Great Commission. We have things to do. But when we come to this place together, our purpose is to learn and grow. But our, one of our primary purposes is to worship, meaning to focus your adoration and attention on God and who he is and what he has done. Worship is so important. We talked about this a few weeks ago on Wednesday night, we talked about the fact that this book, First Chronicles, one of the themes of this book is David's worship of God. And we're seeing it here at the end of his life. He is worshiping God by consecrating and being generous. And he's moving the people to worship God because of this. 
And all of this worship is really, they look at everything going on, and they don't, they're not, oh, we're so great. Look at all we're doing for the Lord. Us Israelites, we're the best. There's no nation on earth as generous as us. We have the best temple in all the earth. Do you sense any of that? I don't get a single sense in this passage of pride. All that they're doing, all that God's using them to do, the glory, the greatness, and they're channeling all that splendor and gratitude into worship and saying, God, you're so good. Biblical generosity enables worship. What a great response. You know, we're going to see in Acts that unbiblical generosity brought division, judgment, and was a source of, a source of pride. Somebody, man, I'm doing a lot of spoiler alerts tonight. Man, I got to be careful. Somebody gave for the wrong reasons. Somebody wanted attention. Somebody wanted to be approved by the people. And that kind of unbiblical generosity brought hurt and judgment. Severe judgment. But that's not what we have here. We have biblical generosity that with the right attitude, with the right thinking, and it had the right impact. Let me just encourage you as Christians, let me just encourage us as a church. And I want to say as we're wrapping up tonight, I am so thankful for our church. You all have shown yourself to be such a generous church. To me as your pastor, to visitors, to missionaries, to people in need, to our community. In so many ways, our church has shown ourselves to be generous. And I just want to, I want to encourage you and thank you for that. But let me encourage us we need to continue. And let, we need to do this. We need to make sure that our generosity is biblical. Because pride always wants to seep in, doesn't it? Pride wants to seep in and cause division and hurt. And so this is instructive for us. This is a good reminder for us. That if we're going to continue in being generous people. And if we're going to continue in being a generous church, that we have to have the right attitude, which is what? Willingness. We have to have the right thinking, that it's a privilege to give, that everything we have comes from God, that everything we have belongs to God. And then, when we give generously, the Lord will bless, and he'll bring about joy, he'll allow us to continue the work, and then we'll be able to worship God for it. And let's make sure we do that last step. You know, I mentioned this morning that we got a gift last week, $15,000. Praise the Lord for that. That's a blessing. That's a blessing when somebody decided to do that. That is a blessing, but let's worship God for it. Let's worship God for what he does. Let's be generous. I want to turn back over. I'm going to, let's see. I, gotta, I want to turn to one verse as we close. This wasn't in my notes, so I got to look here. I read the first verse here. Let's close in 2 Corinthians. Let's turn in our Bible over there. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Such a fitting passage to tie a bow on this topic. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's read verses 6 through 8. It says... But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Don't miss verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every, by the way, that's the word all, may abound in all good works. You know what this passage is saying? When opportunities come up, we as Christians should be generous and trust God that he's going to provide. Let me encourage you, be looking for opportunities to be generous. Some of you are very generous. Others of you maybe struggle with this. Some of us, our personalities are kind of, you know, tight fist or tight pocketed. If you're like that, tonight might be a good opportunity to pray and say, God, help me.
to, as verse 6 says there, to sow sparingly. Help me to be generous. Help me to be biblically generous when God leads me to do so. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this section of scripture. Lord, what a glorious day this was in Israel. Lord, these truths are important reminders for us tonight. Lord, you want us to be generous to you, generous to those around us. Lord, the opposite of this is selfishness and being self-focused. Father, help us not to be focused on ourselves or greedy or carnal. Help us be quick to give. Help us to have a heart that desires to be part of what you're doing. Thank you for these lessons, Lord. Thank you for Calvary Baptist Church and its generosity. Lord, help us to continue that generosity and help us, help us that that generosity might be biblical with a right heart, a right attitude, and that it might be, bring about great things. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. The piano is going to play in a moment with every head bowed. Maybe the Lord's been prompting you about being generous in some way tonight, or maybe he hasn't. Tonight might be an opportunity to say, Lord, how would you have me to be more generous? What would you have me to do? Lord, prepare my heart when opportunities arise so that I can be a generous person. Let's pray.